places in my dreams Telling me where I should go Singing over here Is where I want to be There's melodies in me, yeah Singing this is who I am to Urban Jam Cafe. We're just letting a couple more participants in to join us for the session and in about a minute or two's time we'll get the session going. So for now, sit back, relax and we'll commence in about two minutes time. Good afternoon and welcome to Urban Jam Cafe. Today's session is titled Reimagining New Media and Voices. And I am your host for this afternoon. I'm super excited for this one. As somebody in the entertainment space, I really am looking forward to what our speakers have to share with us. Um, so a couple of house rules before we get into today's session. One, if you are going to be tweeting some of our speakers quotes, please make sure on your social media pages, you include the hashtags Jam Lab Meetup, Urban Fest 2020, as well as Urban October and Civic Tech. Uh, secondly, when our speakers are going to be getting their platform, pretty please switch off your mics. We are trying to ensure that we can hear them quite clearly and that there's no disturbance or distraction happening while they're talking. So please make sure that your mics are muted. And if we would like to just solely focus on our speaker. If you look at the speaker's frame, everybody has three dots at the top of their frame, top right-hand corner. So if you solely want to focus on them and nobody else in the room, because there are quite a number of us here, then just click there to pin the speaker. Then you can just solely focus on the speaker at that moment. Another thing is to pretty please ask as many questions as you would like. There's a lot of things happening on the continent. So please make sure that you go onto our chat box at the very 
very bottom there and ask your questions to our very awesome speakers today. And the last thing that I have to say is uh, please enjoy this session. It is a new media and voices session. So much happening on the African continent as well as the world. So please make sure you engage as much as possible and that you enjoy. But before we get into today's session, you know, I always bring you some fantastic entertainment. Today we have Emma Mabe. And Emma Mabe is a poet. Last week for our session, she gave us Evolution's tune. And today she's giving us Unraveling. So enjoy. The foundation of our house was built on an anthem. The anthem was a prayer our heart rendered in the language of silence. The rooms reflect our hearts with no light, no warmth. The floors balance the stones our souls carry. Flowers withered by bitter breath. Cold crawls over us and nibbles at our seams. We never knew lack until poverty found residency in our mouths. Despondency has been rattling the door's hinges. Notwithstanding that, tonight we're hosting a dinner to find out how we got here. How we have come to this house, come I see you, to further life or to end it. Who bribed us into deserting our lifeline? We asked all and sundry to come dine with us. A night that stretched for 26 years. We served organic suggestions that night, topped with rhetorical questions. These guests are not here to eat the plight of our life's stories, to hear how we are not living to go to heaven, but to not look at every meal as though it's the last supper. We all keep glancing at equality with faint smiles trying to ignore how we became victimized by the spoils of a struggle. No one often reminds the ones oppressed how tyrannical giants fall. So when fortune favors them, greed has them inflating, bursting beyond their bellies. Illusions of democracy attempt to open my mouth, but reality has this tongue feeling like a severed limb. There are gaps in this conversation of intellectual liberation that have our voices shifting as tectonic plates. Until Father Time uttered his only words that evening, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Abruptly, labor shattered to capitalism. This forged long run romance between us and progress is no longer glue that keeps this house together. We have redefined moral hazards dealt a hand to hedge everything but the people. With a smug, capitalism retorted, don't feed on what you can't fund. The futurist put on his contact lens to comment. This house is on fire. All present are flooding it with emptiness, drenching every space with blood clots to save its foundation. Tip the scans. Sorrow has assaulted your lungs for far too long. Deflate into a readiness to flow. Teach the mind so the heart may preserve its lessons. Our minds are gifts. Earth acknowledges our presence. And so the next day, we sprinkled, dusted off distrust, washed the years of betrayal off the walls, washed inequality off our skin, watched injustice flow out the baths and see it drain stagnation's throat. To hear our own esophagus emphasize the echo of victories, our stomachs are yet to clasp. Soak ourselves in knowledge from Urban Festival 2020, embracing our best ideals which await in plenty. We will refurnish every room with a lived experience, embedded in the sight of memory, not yet sung of us. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Emma Mabie giving us an unraveling. She's absolutely phenomenal. We've heard her for the first time here uh, for this month, and she's our poet. 
rest of the month, which is absolutely phenomenal. So while our live performance, Chef and the Kitchen get ready, I would like us to do something very fun that we did last week. I would love for all of us to pretty please sit on our cameras because we want to take a group picture of everybody here. So if you can, for just a couple of seconds, sit on your cameras. Kumo will be on standby. I will count her down and on one, if you please need to take a beautiful smile and Kumo is going to take a picture of us. We just want to make sure that we capture everybody that is here. I'm seeing Mpo scratching her head. I see Dapo. I see Anel. Um, so everybody seems to be here and enjoying. Priscilla, hello. I see you over there. Um, just keep your mics muted, but I do see you just waiting for everybody else. One of our speakers actually from two weeks ago, uh, Stephen Horn is here as well. Hello to you, Stephen, um, with a beautiful smile over there and a wave. So we're just going to wait for a couple more faces. I'm going to count Kumo down. We're going to take a beautiful group picture and then Chef and the Kitchen are going to give us their flavor for today. All right, I think that's the majority of us. Kumo, just thumbs up if you're ready for me. She is ready, so I'm going to count you down from five on one. Everybody with a beautiful smile, and then we're going to get back into our proceedings. <laughs> Nati giving us a dance over there. Okay, so in five, four, three, two, one, big smile. <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm there from everybody else thank you so much for that if you would like you can switch off your camera uh chef and the kitchen are from orange farm and they are an afro jazz funk band so i think they're going to be bringing it on so boys let's go Chef, I'm here for my oven. Uh, Kanye, the guitarist. Thank you so much for having us today at Gem Cafe's um, uh, Event Festival 2020. We are going to play our first song. Our first song is called uh, Uno Matemba. We believe this is our hit song in our first album, the first recipe. Hope you enjoy. Buya no mate, 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 buya no Jalo Mkabanga in Zela, Ong Pamba Nayo, Nen Zela, and Yik Pamba Nayo, in his Yoyami, Ia Pagusa, Ikazlami, Ia Kichima, Mwaba Pelawana, who is Ya 
Kwa wana mafuwe chungu, mkalu kunchela ngono matemba. Uno matemba, ndo mbi ndo, uti noma, emo izela, etuwa izela, zongi nzizo, nshama kwela, ngobo pela yena, ui ndo mbi ndo. Mingako, nitigue. Sando asa, laviwa. That is no matter what. So right now we're going to do a song. Um, this song um, is called Believe. Um, it's our next singing that we're going to use the chef and the kitchen music. Hope you can enjoy, yeah. It goes like this. Who is the busy so gimme? Basa mile, basulega. Oh, baby. Oh. 
Thank you very much. Let's shuffle the kitchen music. Absolutely fantastic. Well done, Chef in the Kitchen. That was amazing. We have our speakers even clapping for you. So that was amazing. I saw Mimi bobbing her head while you guys were performing. Uh, some people in the comment section be clapping uh, throughout and others just going, Emmanuel saying, wow, Chef in the Kitchen, you guys are absolutely amazing. So we cannot wait to have you towards the end of our uh, presentation today. So hang on tight if that is what you absolutely love. Please make sure you stay tuned throughout the presentation. They'll be performing two more songs again at the end see you later guys all right so what is a reimagining new media and voices are really all about so we'll be getting into some interesting developments about public opinion and and how it is formed and what are the new roles of media and we'll also be talking about some implications some new opportunities as well as some lessons learned from some of the things that we've gone through as a continent so without any further ado i'm going to be introducing my first speaker his name is al tags and he is from kenya he is the founder of the Open Institute, an African organization that works with governments and civil society organizations to promote open government and citizen engagement. Primarily, Al works across Sub-Saharan Africa, but contributes to global open government movements. He sits on the Technical Advisory Committee of the Global Partnership for sustainable development data. I spoke to him quite earlier on and I know he's very excited about today's session. Uh, please make sure you ask him as many questions as possible. We will have a Q&A afterwards and they will engage with you in the comment section there below. Uh, Al, you've got 15 minutes. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure. I'm really excited to be here um, uh, to speak to you today. Um, the question of media and the and how to reach people is one that excites me a great deal. Um, it's my background. I, my background is in media, so this is a space that I, I am quite excited in, even though I work in governance now. Um, I think I want to, uh, given that you have given me such little time, um, one hour and 15 minutes is such a, such a short time, um, I thought I would make um, six um, key points about um, the interesting developments that I, am, I have been observing within the, the media space. Um, and I think that all of these points um, gear to how and we might, might want to think about responding to it. So those are the, the six, I'm going to make six and three points. So the six points I want to make is this. The interesting developments that I am observing is number one, that um, is the advent of the short video. So for the longest time, um, during the time that I was a journalist, long after, um, video was was video happened on TV, and it happened in long form. So um, just like music happened happened in long form. If you listen to music from um, the 70s, it, it, the average um, music um, timeline would be about five minutes. Now, if you get a, a song that is three minutes long, you know you're you're stretching it because of the fact that there's a lot of people are being hit by so much content. And so they have a lot less, um, you know, um, availability of time to go through one piece of content. The average um, timeline of a content piece is now three minutes and it's getting shorter and shorter. In fact, now it has come to a point where TikTok and, and Viskit are becoming the biggest um, media houses because of the fact that now, if it's a minute long, it's long enough. Um, it, you have to be able to pass my message in, in one minute. Of course, for those of us who come from deep stories, that's a, not nearly enough time, but that's how it is. The second thing is that because of this, the journalist is having to change. In Kenya, we have a guy called Edgar Obare, who's kind of like our, our biggest gossip um, journalist, so to speak. So if he if he has a dirt on noni, um, or what they call in, in Kenya now, he, they call it tea. If he has tea on noni, then he, what he will do is that he'll put it up on um, his Instagram um, stories. Um, and there'll be a series of stories about, so this is... This is who she was with. This is how he's blown up. He's like very, um, this, um, this content. 
sorry, I noticed my, my, my internet was a little unstable, but I hope you got that. that um, so the, the, the journalist is changing. He's changing to a person who is going to be able to tell stories on their, on their Instagram um, storyline. Um, and then the, the third thing is the rise of community media. So you're having, because of the fact that people are not as homogenous as they used to be, people have very specific interests now. And therefore, the, the, my community is no longer the people who live around me, but it's the people who I identify with. And therefore, um, media is becoming a lot more nuanced in terms of trying to make sure that they are addressing themselves to my community or to a particular community. So the community of guys who, for example, like style, may not consume news at all. Um, and it's an interesting um, thing that is happening more and more and more where you're noticing that people who, who like, even where news is concerned, people who like um, gossip type news don't want any um, deep investigative pieces. They don't really get excited by stories on corruption and so on and so forth. But even while that is true, this is the fifth point that, um, or the fourth point that there's a serious rise in the socially conscious audience. So they want, so you're, 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 you're finding small pockets of nuanced groups that are enjoying um, you know, to hear stuff that is, that, that helps them to feel like they're being socially responsible. So you're talking about people who care about the environment, people who care about food, people who care about sustainability. And I'm talking really about the new generation of, of Africans who are, you know, young. And then as a result of all of this, the traditional, this is my favorite, Point. The traditional media houses are on the decline, unfortunately. The way that they used to be huge conglomerates that was a TV, uh, um, you know, like you have a TV station, a radio, a radio station, and a newspaper, and they're all collaborating. That's all sort of dissipating as podcasts and, and as news, as reporting gets more and more decentralized. As the reporter stops being the person who went to media school but who, and becomes the person who has a story to tell. Um, and because of this, we are now realizing that even from a technology perspective, the delivery of news has changed. It has changed from the fact that I used to go to nation.co.k to grab my news, and it has now come to my mobile. So suddenly, whatever is on my Twitter, I go to Twitter first to, for all my news. And then I, I, if there's anything that I want to investigate in a little more depth, then I'll move on to YouTube or to whatever it is to actually see the story in in more detail. These six points um, are being driven by the fact that 77% of Africans are under 35. The, those six points are also driven by um, the fact that these 77% are not homogenous. They're not the same. Um, they're not, you cannot generalize them anymore. So what does this mean for us? It means, number one, that nonprofits and governments have to redefine what publicity means. What, how they want to tell. It used to be that even in a lot of the laws that are written, that um, you will have been deemed to have publicized your story if it has been in a national newspaper. That's no longer true anymore because majority of the newspapers, at least in many other countries in Africa, are very fast on the decline. And then relevance has changed to uh, what it used to be and has become a lot more nuanced to, um, as I said, deal with people within my community. Now, if this is all true, then what that means is that um, news has, or, or media is going to be a lot more bite-sized and it's going to address itself to a lot more bite-sized communities. So all of us have got to take on a bite-sized approach towards reaching as many people as we can because of the fact that the same news story or the same story has to be recrafted to, to um, fit different channels and different audiences um, as much as possible. I think I'm going to stop there, um, and then I'll, I'll probably come back if there's any questions about anything that I said. Thank you so much, Al. That was fantastic. We got into a proper, serious lesson today. I've got my six points written down here. 
in my notebook. So thank you so much for those tips. Uh, without any further ado, we're going to go to our next speaker. His name is Tomiwa Aledokomo, and he's from Nigeria. He's an experienced executive. He's worked extensively across media and marketing roles in Nigeria and North America. And in Nigeria, he led the team that transformed the Guardian Nigeria into a top-notch digital media operation. He's worked in senior roles, leading digital for Heineken Nigeria, and heading one of West Africa's top digital agencies. He's worked in the U.S. for companies like Atlantic Records and the Futures Company, where he worked on global strategy briefs for brands from Coca-Cola to Unilever. Quite an impressive resume there, Mr. Tobiwa. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. You can take Thank it away. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Um, I'm not sure this is a fantastic connection, so I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, it's an interesting time to be coming to speak on this panel. Um, the last time I'm calling from Lagos, Nigeria, where the last couple of weeks have extensive uh, networking because these have been a lesson in the way sort of communication is. So over the last two weeks, these protests have been organized across the country. They've been entirely decentralized with no centrally identified leader uh, to the protests. And this has been a thing of perplexion for a lot of the older generation trying to understand why it is that the protesters would not throw up a single leader. Um, I hope, you, can you hear me, my clerk? Okay, um, and it's also been an interesting thing in terms of seeing how organized and how effective these protests have been. Um, despite this lack of a central leadership, despite this uh, lack of visible organization. And so a lot of this coordination has happened over social media, it's happened over messaging apps. Um, and I will say that they've been spectacularly effective um, until a couple of days when the government sort of threw up its standard violent response, which is what unfortunately too many of our governments know um, how to do. Um, but how are these uh, protests successful? Um, over the last two weeks, the protesters have provided food and drink at each of the protest, major protest locations across the 36 states of Nigeria. They've built a legal response system across the entire country, uh, helping to build protests out like minutes after they were arrested, identifying people, been taken to stations where uh, records have not been taken very well. Um, they built an actual IVR system so you can call in and call for uh, supplies or legal aid. And I think what's really interesting about that is that the, the change in communication is not just about the tools that we have, it's the way that we use them um, and the mentality that we use them. And I think a lot more African youth and a lot more people these days are looking at communication differently and are able to move faster in more decentralized ways uh, than they traditionally would. Um, and so this leaderless movement has been more effective in building structure and supporting people at a national scale and level than institutions which you know every year have billions and billions of naira uh budgeted for them um so i think it's been a really really interesting and instructive case study in the way in which we are changing our engagement with our, ourselves and our engagement with media and communication i think another interesting aspect of it has been the press coverage, where you've seen the traditional newspapers, of course, doing sort of the government line or ignoring the protests um, as much as possible. Whereas a series of smaller publications um, and independent publications, um, primarily digital publications, have kind of taken up the slack, chronicling and recording for history's sake exactly what it is happening. And so the um, along with that, one or two small television stations, some of the more independent ones also playing the role in terms of actually speaking to the players, uh, being on ground and interviewing. And it's been really interesting because you've seen where the government has sort of staged opposition 
uh, protests where people come and are suddenly pro a unit that's known for massive brutality. And then there's 13 television stations that haven't interviewed anybody on the protest side, suddenly interviewing these people on the counter protest side. Uh, so it's interesting, some of this is more traditional propaganda and tra traditional propaganda battles, but some of it also showcases sort of the need for these new digital platforms, these smaller independent platforms and the power in which they carry to actually, uh, to actually sort of shape a narrative, to make sure that there's a complete record of what it is that's happening, uh, to counter disinformation, which uh, there's been a flood of over the last 48 hours. Um, so I think we're in an interesting moment. I'm happy to be here to share this conversation. I look forward to the questions. Um, I don't know if I've not, I've not given a framework to understand uh, communication in the modern day uh, in the same way that the previous speaker did. But I do hope that um, some of this is valuable and it's interesting and it's worth thinking about. Um, if you're looking to get a bit more of a sense of what is happening in Nigeria, you know, check out the hashtag NSARS on Twitter. Um, go to publications like uh, Tech Cabal and Zikoko um, and Steers Nigeria, um, which are doing fantastic work covering what is happening um, in the absence of sort of a lot of mainstream coverage um, uh, in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy. I don't know, you've given us more than enough. Um, I think in the Q&A session, you're probably going to get a lot of questions because right now Nigeria is literally at the forefront of what is happening on the continent. So don't worry, you'll have the opportunity to, to give us a little bit more detail when we get into the Q&A session. Um, next up, we have the Rose Among the Thorns. Uh, one of our speakers for today is Mimi Kalinda, and she is the group CEO and co-founder of the Africa Communications Media Group, a pan-African public relations and communications agency headquartered in Johannesburg, South Africa. ACG clients include MTN, Barlow World, um, Dahlberg and Nesta, only to mention a few. Mimi started the company because of a need to tell African stories in an authentic, culturally nuanced way. She started the company with her own savings while working full-time for an employer and ventured out on her own in 2015. A very brave lady, Mimi is. Mimi, you have 15 minutes. Can't wait to hear what you have to share with us today. Thank you so much, Noni, uh, for that introduction. And thank you also for having me. Uh, really interesting to hear my fellow uh, panelists interventions and give me a lot to think about. So thank you to both of them as well. Um, you know, and I think I'll just jump on kind of what Tommy just said um, around what's happening in Nigeria and also being in the media space and being in the communication space myself. Just want to call out a little bit, take the opportunity to call out our own African media. Um, you know, I think that it's been really interesting to see the coverage that's been uh, coming out of Nigeria. Um, obviously, you know, thank goodness we live in a time when, uh, you know, and I'll speak about it a little bit, each one of us is media um, in 2020. We're able to capture what's happening around us, around the world, on our phones, share it, comment on it and start a community around it. So it's hugely exciting. But what's been disappointing is to see kind of the mainstream coverage around what's happening in Nigeria coming out of Western media and very little coverage from our own media. And what happens in Nigeria, whether you live in Cape Town or whether you live in Cairo or Egypt, affects all of us. Um, and so I, I really do think that our, our own media houses can do a much better job. Um, having said that, I think, uh, you know, going back to this idea of all of us being media, um, it's kind of a double edged sword. So I wanted to give my perspective a little bit on those uh, on, on that. Um, in terms of pros, I think you know, we live in an age where very little can go uncovered. Um, and so, you know, the types of uh, human rights abuses that we're seeing in Nigeria, in Congo, it's been going on for over two decades now, um, in Mozambique, in Namibia, um, you know, it's really, a, it's actually quite an interesting time to look at the continent in 2020, despite the fact that we're living in a global pandemic, they are, um, they're very real, issues that are now being brought to the fore in each one of our, our corners around around the continent 
but very little can, can remain uncovered. So that's fantastic because, you know, we can now bring to justice a lot of people who, you know, would normally go without a scratch. Um, you know, now we can kind of, you know, bring people to accountability in terms of the things that, that they're doing. Um, and that's exciting. I think also being able to have the most vulnerable amongst us have a voice Finally, you know, when I look at, um, you know, my own country, uh, Rwanda, for example, um, you know, a couple of years ago in 1994, when the genocide exploded in that country, you know, imagine if in 1994, we had this, the same kind of power of social media and digital presence as we currently do. Um, you know, I always ask myself, would the genocide would have, would it have happened and would it have been as, um, as, uh, as terrible as it was, you know? So I think that the, we live in an age now where social media or digital platforms and this penetration of conversation and community uh, awareness is really giving the most vulnerable people amongst us a voice, and that's fantastic. I think also we um, are now able to mobilize people and resources faster and at a much much bigger volume than we were before, um, which is great. So, you know, we've seen a couple of campaigns. I mean, one of our, our, our clients, one campaign um, is running a very, very, um, you know, impactful and compelling campaign around gender-based violence and other things. And just the speed at which we're able to bring people and resources in one room uh, and put them towards a cause is, is uh, uh, is astounding. In terms of the cons, um, obviously starting with the most ob obvious one is uh, is fake news. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's the world that we live in. So being uh, more of a critical thinker in terms of the sort of media that we consume and the sort of messaging that we we we're, we ourselves are are putting up into the world. Um, also, the regulation of government. Um, you know, I my business partner is based in Ethiopia, and every couple of weeks, you know, the government shuts down the internet. Uh, we're not able to get a hold of him. We don't know what's happening in the country. It's not often, but I think you've seen that in in Ethiopia, and you've seen that in a number of other countries where, as soon as certain things start to come to light the government shuts down the internet and so you know people are not able to communicate with uh, with their counterparts around the world um and then finally um you know it's it's been used to to promote dissent hatred in the case of south africa sometimes xenophobia i have to say one of the things that really shocked me to the court today was to watch you know at the same time as we have the nsars hashtag um, you know, you have in South Africa a hashtag that's now trending, which is SARS must rise. And it's really, really sad to watch that, you know, as an African and to say, you know, what's happening in Nigeria and to have South Africans, certain, you know, uh, 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 some South Africans think that that's an opportunity to really, uh, you know, talk, you know, just spread hatred and dissent and, and, and xenophobia amongst us is very, very painful to me as an as a African living in South, in South Africa, but also as an African in general. So I think for me, it's, a, it's an interesting time to watch how media is moving from its traditional form to a more digitized form, the power that we have just in our hands with our phones, um, and uh, but how that's being used, uh, again, like I said at the beginning, is a double-edged sword, both very, very powerful, but also extremely dangerous. So I'm looking forward to exploring that uh, more, and I hope that, Noni, it, it covers your, your question. I could have gone on and on and on, but you were very strict at the beginning when we started, and you said, don't today so i'm gonna stop there thank you so much mimi you are just pleasant <laughs> but to, just to add on mimi i really think you you took the words out of my mouth because in as much as we're speaking about the nsars movement that's happening in nigeria there's so many other movements on the continent you know that really need our, our attention just the other day we had zim lives matter due to police brutality in our country in south africa you know, we have gender-based violence as well as in countries like Namibia. In Congo, they're literally fighting over, you know, resources. 
And then in, in Cameroon, you have instances where, you know, the Anglophones fighting um, with, the, with the Francophones. You know, so there's just so many issues that are happening on the continent. And sometimes as a consumer of media, I'm not too sure if I'm, you know, definitely getting the correct information from what I'm consuming, you know, considering the fact that I'm probably on Instagram or on Twitter. So, so this question is, is for you, uh, uh, Tomiwa. Do, do you think that media is doing enough to uh, inform the consumer of media, uh, especially considering what Mimi was saying in terms of calling out our own African media and us not doing enough? Interesting question. <laughs> and, I don't, and I'm not sure I have the answer to it. Um, do we critique our own media enough and the work that we do? I feel like I see a fair bit of it. Um, and we do have these panels where we like to judge amongst ourselves and uh, talk about the state of things. And so I feel like we do call it out. We do sort of criticize the media and ourselves. Um, I think there's a bit of a power imbalance where the sort of most powerful or the largest sort of media publications across the content uh, across the continent tend to be government funded or tend to be supported by the dominant powers in each of these countries and so um you know you're with your small voice uh you know pitching at much larger sort of entities and so often it's easy to be drowned out because you know you are not the state entity and you're not the state supported entity and so for uh, someone like me who is building an independent media business, our goal is to get large enough, you know, to become the dominant sort of voices in the conversation and to, to do that while maintaining our independence from, you know, sort of government purchase and uh, those kind of structures that tend to silence you and prevent you from actually speaking truth um, uh, with any sort of um, passion or integrity. Um, but yeah, I think we call it out. I just think it's uh, smaller voices pitching against larger voices. Thanks for that, Tomiwa. Just a, a comment from Leslie there after what you, you mentioned about that hashtag coming out of South Africa, Mimi. She says, that's really sad and crazy. Twitter can be such a toxic space and it would be good to monitor just how much it's a reflection of the sentiments of most South Africans. And Gechi also saying, you know, that's why I'm not on Twitter, thank goodness, you know, because it, it can be quite a, a toxic environment. Uh, this question is for you, Al. Um, Getchi says, as, as an old woman, I, I don't know where she gets the word old from, but okay. <laughs> well, on one hand, I'm glad that my 14-year-old who lives on TikTok is now following news and events such as SARS, Black Lives Matter, etc., and not just dancing her life away. I'm also a bit concerned about how shallow the engagement is. Are we losing or gaining mileage here or rebuilding social media awareness and or informed activism? Quite a, a question there. Well, um, you know, for us old fogies, um, it's a big tragedy because of the fact that we worry about the fact that um, nuance is lost. We worry about depth is lost and we worry that our kids are just dancing and, and doing very little with, uh, with media. The thing that we do have to get comfortable with is that thing that is that thing that I was talking about. You know, the death of homogeneity, the fact that we are not homogenous anymore. Um, so we need to get comfortable with the idea that um, our bite-sized news on Instagram um, on Instagram um, uh, stories or on TikTok are the ones that people are going to see. So. Um, Millions of people will see your, your TikTok, will see your story on Facebook. And then after, oh, actually not Facebook, because the young ones are not on Facebook. It's just all, us old folk who are on Facebook now. Um, but it's those um, millions of people will see that little bite-sized story. And if it's interesting enough for them, then what will happen is that it will lead them to go and look for the podcast that will explain it to them in more detail, or to look for the YouTube video, or to look for the documentary, or to look for the, you know, Vox Explainer, whatever it is. But... Um, we have to get comfortable that the number of people who will actually click through to the podcast or to the deeper um, story, to the deeper explanation, will be less than a thousand people out of a million people who have seen um, the story. And we have to get comfortable with that because of the fact that, uh, again, we are going to be finding that different stories are going to be addressing themselves to a very specific group of people or a very specific um, community of people. And that community is not where I live, but it's 
the kind of people who are like me or who are interested in my things. So on TikTok, for example, the dances, the pranks, those are the biggest things. Anybody who's explaining something, that comes a third. And anybody who's talking about any, anything serious, um, they don't really go very far because of the fact that it scrolled up very, very fast. And that that's is the, very true. That is the world that we have to get comfortable with. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Al. Uh, a couple more questions coming through. I'll, I'll ask them accordingly. But uh, back to you, Mimi, as, as, a, as a black female living in South Africa, um, having to, to face or to hear about gender-based violence in this country, from your point of view living in Johannesburg, do you think that media is doing enough to inform us about what is coming out of South Africa? I have to say yes. I think uh, on the issue of gender-based violence, I think we've really risen to the challenge. Um, um, however, I think that it's probably a bit too far down the line. Um, I mean, the issue of gender-based violence in South Africa and in Africa in general is not a new one. Um, you know, we live in a very patriarchal society and women for many, many decades have been kind of trampled upon and killed and murdered. And I mean, the list just goes on and on. So I think that, you know, we got to a point where the media could no longer ignore it and therefore had to cover it and, and cover it extensively. Um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, frankly, for me, it's too little, too late. So, you know, I mean, I think that it, it's great to make the effort, but I think that when, when one of the, the um, kind of foundational, I suppose, vows that the media take, or at the very least should, should take, is that, um, you know, bringing to light issues that affect society um, is, is, is a must. So when you see that, um, you know, I mean, I've been a victim of, of gender-based violence before, um, and I know many, many women who have. Um, so for somebody like me to be sitting in 2020 and for all of a sudden for us to have a hashtag that's trending around gender-based violence is too little, too late. Um, and I don't think that the media has been responsible for long enough to bring these issues to light. And I think that they could have done better. Absolutely agree with you there. Sure, no, it's, it's, getting, it's getting quite intense. Please feel free to ask your questions. I'm seeing some questions coming through. Also one from Wusi that came through to Al, but Al will get into that question just after this one. So to me, I'm going to direct this one to you. This one is from one of our speakers that we had in our first week. Uh, his name is Stephen Horn, and he says, how do we square the view that very short form content now dominates with the rise of longer form podcast type formats example, the Joe Rogan, or even longer Fox media type uh, explainer journalism. Is Africa on a different path or earlier in the curve towards long form in the US, perhaps? Could it be a bandwidth or data issue? Hmm. <laughs> Very interesting questions. Uh... <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> I think consumer habits are changing in interesting ways and at the same time as we are, I think, yeah, consumer habits are changing and we're consuming different things in different ways because at the same time as we're consuming TikTok and lots of that short form content, which you can do in between any two things and which you know, are easily distracted with, it's like, you know, the second you leave me alone, I'm going to like kind of take a look at my phone and like giggle at something. We've also kind of, we're also being trained differently to consume long form content. And so it's your commute from your house to work and you can listen to a podcast the entire time. And it doesn't matter if you're driving or on the bus, you can plug in your headphones and that gives you a different way to use that particular bit of time. We're being trained for longer form content through things like Netflix, which will drop a whole season of a show at once. And so, you're going to sit down and you're going to do 10 hours of Emily in Paris or uh, whatever it is, you know. Um, and so I think our habits are being shaped by the media that's available in interesting ways. And some of them are a bit contrasting. Are we earlier or later on the continent? My sense of the continent is that our habits are molded by our realities. And so uh, power. Uh, there's lots of, well, 
sorry, as a Nigerian, um, you know, power is a constraint. And like, how often, you know, do you have power? And what does that, you know, maybe that means that you generally watch uh, content at night because that's when you're likely to have power or that's when data is cheaper. Um, I know that a lot of our consumption, when we look at like the data, we know a lot of people consume content when they're in their offices. So that's one audience segment, which is, you know, office workers, and that's, you know, so you're, you're on the office internet. And so that's when you're consuming that content. Um, but students are constantly looking for the cheapest deal and, you know, um, will binge as soon as they're somewhere that has free Wi-Fi. So I th think consumer habits are shaped by the reality and our consumption habits are shaped by the realities of where it is that we live and all of these sort of like associated things around us, conditions around us, um, and shaped by the media that is available to us and the way it is released. So um, I think it's hard to draw definitive patterns, but, um, and I think from a media perspective, it definitely requires us to pay attention to what's happening in your specific environment and the specific audience that you serve to make sure that you're not sort of creating content for an American audience when you've got, you know, people with, you know, uh, the patterns of media consumers in Kigali, basically. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Tomiwa. Look, we know well, we know quite a lot about power here in South Africa as well. We have what we call load shedding. So when you speak about power, I can definitely relate. Ah. <laughs> the next question. <laughs> The next question is for Al from Wusima Tabani, who says, what do you make of journalists who rewrite Twitter posts as news without any effort to get a formal comment from the source or whoever the story is about? Mm. What do you have to say about that, Al? I think that the guys who are um, um, effecting the death of traditional media. Um, I think those are the guys who are assuring us that the traditional media as we have known it um, is dead because of the fact that it's what we have always called lazy journalism. So um, if I've already gotten the story from Twitter, then why do I need to go into your article to read the story? And over time, well, um, it's going to go, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's like what um, a lot of these um, new blog sites have been doing where they say 10 things about Tommy One that w and number seven would shock you. And then when you go in there, you just discover that actually, there's actually really nothing shocking in there. Eventually, you become desensitized and you, and you come to understand that it was just clickbait. Um, what's going to eventually happen, in my view, is that, um, you know, the alternative media houses that are more authentic, that are, are trying hard to be true to the authenticity of the story are going to rise. And these journalists are eventually going to either ship um, ship up or shape out. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Al. Uh, maybe I'm going to ask you this question from Madanga, who says, does increased use of social media in African countries risk increased political polarization because of social media's tendency to reinforce echo chambers, as has been seen in some democracies like the US and the UK and India? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and I just wanted to start off by just also piggybacking um, off of what Al just said around, uh, you know, social media and, and lazy journalism. And, you know, I mean, but how much do we train our media? How much access to research do they have? You know, I mean, I've, I, in my work, you know, as a PR person, I work with media on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, just the lack, um, I suppose, you know, research methodology and depth uh, that one would expect from journalists in some of our countries is just absolutely non-existent so i think a lot of the blame that we put on media sometimes is you know is is uh, not necessarily warranted given the ecosystem in which they work um so you know training for journalists access to 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 really thorough research um, understanding methodology and good journalism schools um, those are some of the things that I think we really need to look at as well. In terms of uh, polarization, I think it goes without saying. I mean, when you look at what's happening in the U.S., we're not immune to that in Africa. Um, 
I think that it, uh, social media does uh, provide a platform for people to voice their opinions and in voicing those opinions, uh, you know, we're all able to um, fortunately or unfortunately take sides. And that's what that's what's happening. So the answer to that question is is definitely yes. Uh, I mean, all you have to do is go on Twitter to be able to see what's happening there. Yeah, Melissa going on to say, can we really call them journalists if they're just copy pasting tweets and writing a story? <laughs> is it a truly journalism? Uh, Tibi, I'm going to give this one to you. Uh, with so much news going on on social media and us just being fed, you know so much information. Do you think that media is, is evolving and exposing, you know, what has what is actually happen, happening on, on the continent? Or do you think that, you know, truth in, in Africa just getting worse? Is media um, exposing what's already been happening? Or are we just as a continent just heading the wrong direction? I think very much so. Um, as much as social media allows you to find out what's happening immediately, people start to tweet about it. The truth of the matter is that investigative journalism is still about digging up things that people, uh, it's still about digging up things that people don't know that aren't obvious, that aren't happening on the main street. It's still about going behind uh, the scenes to, to sort of find out the reality behind things. And so for instance, I mean, you know, if you've been on social media for the last 48 hours in Nigeria or focusing on Nigeria, you've received a lot of information. You've also received a lot of misinformation and a lot of disinformation. It's going to take a lot of work by the media. Um, it's going to take a lot of work by thoughtful and sort of diligent people to sort out what exactly it is that's happened over the last 48 hours. And the truth of the matter is that that's not going to be done by, you know, like to me, we're tweeting away or Mimi tweeting away um, about, you know, or sharing the latest video without, you know, thinking about it. It's going to happen when some people take a step back and do the homework and do the interviews and do the digging. And I mean, we know that investigative reporting is sort of expensive. Um, it's not something that anybody can do. Um, so lazy media can't accomplish some of these things and you still need people to do, I mean, in Nigeria, we've definitely seen sort of major investigative stories, people, you know, going undercover to find out about sort of like, you know, professors making students sleep with them for grades or, you know, the state of our prisons. And so all of that investigative journalism has been done by media organizations. Um, it's absolutely critical. Even beyond that, just pure analysis and actually like taking a step back and looking at things and thinking through them and sort of giving people the context to sort of like, you know, join A and B or make a connection between Z and R so that people understand how things connect to one another. That's not our kind of trigger happy social media habits don't really sort of like account for the needs to do that. And so you still need publications, you still need media outlets that are gonna sort of like think through that stuff and sort of make those connections, um, help people understand the world. Um, and then last thing is sort of making the continent smaller, making the world smaller. Um, so your social media is a reflection of the people that you, know, you follow, the people that, I mean, all of these things are built on social graphs. Um, those of us who still insist on going to specific publications, you know, you get to see things outside of what it is that you might expect, you know, the outside of the world that you built for yourself. I mean, and you're still doing some selection because you're deciding, I want to read, you know, this publication or that publication and that publication's probably got a perspective. But if you pick a broad enough range and a broad enough sort of set of publications, then what the media still does is make the world smaller, is bring things that are far away close to you. And that's valuable. And that's not something that social media will do for you in the same way. You know, and social is super valuable, social is super important, um, but it's definitely not fulfilling all of our need, all of our information needs. You know. So we will take us through the, the difference between disinformation and misinformation. Those are the things that just jumped at me. Holy smokes, that's, uh, I'm not, I'm going to fail that. <laughs> give me a moment and let me do it. Um, uh, yeah, give me, give me a moment and I will answer that. Let me think through Fantastic. it so that I don't get it wrong because it's, yeah, it's actually a dangerous one. Yeah, yeah no, this is a very dangerous platform. <laughs> give me a second. So give right. me a second and I will come back to you. Take one more Fantastic. question. I'll come back to you on that. 
Sure, no problem. Uh, just a comment here from Busi saying, thanks for touching on the affordability of data, Tomiwa. In South Africa, we tried to challenge communication companies profiting through the hashtag data must fall campaign, even though most South Africans feel the pinch when it comes to cost, the campaign wasn't well supported as we had hoped for. As Africans, we are doing it as Africans, are we doing enough in addressing the digital divide? Um, Tomiwa, I'll leave you to think of, of that question. I'm going to push this one towards Alcags. Alcags, do you think that as Africans, we are doing enough in addressing the digital divide? Um, my short answer is no. I think there's, there's a lot that we're doing for sure. Um, but I think um, that no, I don't think we're doing enough as Africa. Um, I think there are pockets on, in Africa that are doing quite a great deal um, of interesting things. So um, Kenya, South Africa, um, Ghana, Nigeria, you're seeing interesting activity. Um, but um, Africa is made of 54 countries. And if you go into a lot of these countries, you're finding that um, where the digital divide is concerned, there's very many countries that are still very, very far um, away from um, being being uh, even even nearly uh, you know even near even nearly um, with it so to speak, um, I think there's a lot more for us to do as 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 Africans, and I think it comes from us beginning to make sure that we do it ourselves because um, to a certain extent we have also been living. Not very many of us are like Mimi, who actually will take their savings and make investments in in uh, something that they believe in. Um, that is new, that is fresh, that is different. Um, a lot of people are waiting until there's, um, you know, people from Silicon Valley and other places coming to invest in these things. Um, and that's something that we need to talk about because of the fact that I'm beginning to see um, that some of the biggest emerging media channels are foreign owned with African names. Um, so they sound African, they look African, but when you pull the, pull the curtain back, then you're finding that you know, they're actually owned by, by people from other countries altogether. So there's something that we need to begin to do um, as Africans to actually spend our own money to invest in our own channels that um, make sense to us as a, as a people. But then do you think in that case, then, Al, that, you know, we as Africa, are we really moving digital, you know, especially considering the constraints of, of data and bandwidth? Do we have that opportunity to go digital like the rest of the world? I think we do. I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, if we can start to control um, the space a little bit more, if we can take a little bit more effort to control the space. Otherwise, what is really happening is that majority of us are consumers. Um, we, we buy an iPhone and then we uh, subscribe to Facebook and TikTok and Instagram and whatnot. Um, and then Mimi comes with her channel and we are like, ah, meh. But we, you know, I mean, think about it. In Nigeria, there's a, a news powerhouse, I want to call it, um, called Sahara. Um, that is um, doing a lot of work in terms of talking about African news. But if you ask the average African in Kenya, um, whether they, they subscribe to it, they don't know anything about it. You, in fact, one experiment that I did a couple of weeks ago about news consumption, and I learned that people know a lot more about what is happening in the U.S. than they know about what is happening in Ghana. That's a true story. That is a very true story. Sure. Thanks, Al. Um, Tamiwa, I'll come back to you. I just want to ask Mimi this one quite briefly. Mimi, a question from Danga saying, has increased engagement by youth on political issues in African countries translated into greater youth turnout in elections? What's your take on that? I'm probably the wrong person to, to ask that question because I, I'm not sure how many young people are showing up for elections. I do know that there are more young people that are uh, actively engaged, as, as, as they said, um, in these issues. Um, and I'm hoping that that also means that they're, they're turning out for elections. Um, but also, I think it depends, you know, when we talk about, you know, this is the other thing that we forget as well when we talk about Africa. It's not just that it's 54 countries, but within those countries, you know, you have rural youth, you have urban youth, you have, you know, 
there are so many different disparities that one needs to take into consideration. So when we say youth, you know, it's very interesting because when we talk about youth in Africa, it's always and un sits under the umbrella of African youth. But you know, who are those people? You know, where do they where do they live? You know, what sort of media do they consume? What do they have access to? Um, and uh, and so you know I, I I don't know if that means that they show up for elections, but I do know that they're at least at the very least urban African youth are much more engaged in our political processes. Thanks, thanks for that, Mimi. Tamiwa, are we good to go with the definitions? I've got my pen and my yes, notebook uh, in hand. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. And actually, I think I I was quite right about uh, in terms of what I thought it was. Um, so misinformation yeah. is, is false information and it's false information whether it's intended to deceive you or not. So if I tell you that, you know, this event starts at 7 p.m., even though it actually starts at 8, it might be because I forgot. It might be because, you know, I'm just really bad um, at keeping to time. So that's a misinformation because I've told you something that's incorrect. Whereas disinformation um, is deliberately released information to confuse you. I mean, usually... Propaganda. Yeah, it's propaganda and it's usually it's weaponized uh it's usually in military situations we usually talk about it in military situations although of course you can talk about it in other situations but it's intentional in terms it's malicious it's intentional um and so um if i tell you that it is seven, starting at this event is starting at 7 p.m because i want you to miss it and look stupid then that is disinformation so i think that's the that's the big difference and i think we spread a lot of disinformation uh, both intentionally and otherwise. Um, that's just because humans aren't perfect. But disinformation is something a lot more deliberate, a lot, a lot more manipulative and intentional. Fantastic. Thank you, Pamiwa. <laughs> right, so the next question, I'm going to target it towards Al. Al, I hope you're ready for this one. Do you think social media is reducing or expanding the urban-rural divide in Africa? Is social media largely an urban and a peri-urban phenomenon? Um, I, I don't think we can answer that question like that. I don't think that mm. we can that um, it is an urban period. I don't think we can generalize it to that level. Um, I think in different countries, um, it is true in different ways. Um, in Kenya, for example, we have a very high penetration of social media. Uh, um, and also it depends on which social media we're talking about. But if we're talking about social media in general, and we include, for example, WhatsApp, then in Kenya, we had 100% uh, penetration. Um, in fact, to some extent, 100 and something percent penetration. Um, but that's not true in Chad, for example, where uh, penetration um, is a lot less because of the fact that, um, you know, even the, the usage is a lot less. So, so the, the, I don't know that I can answer that question as, as generally as that. What I can say that in general in Africa, um, social media has become the kind of the main um, general channel for um, consuming content. Um, we're consuming a lot more content via mobile phones. We're consuming a lot more content via our, our social media channels, um, um, a lot more than we are with um, um, you know, the traditional forms. I think right now it's only radio that is ahead of uh, social media right? um, in terms of um, content consumption. Um, in many, many of the African countries. But I'm afraid of answering that question in, in a very general way, because again, the death of homogeneity is real. Mm. I'm actually quite interested to hear what our other speakers have to say. So I'll just repeat the question. Is social media largely an urban and peri-urban phenomenon? Mimi, I'm gonna throw this one to you. What do you think? I think Al has said everything that I was gonna say, basically. <laughs> <laughs> He's smart. Um, so I, I, I mean, I'll just, I'll just piggyback off of what he's saying. I think it's a very general question which we need to dig deeper into. But perhaps Tomiwa has uh, a new perspective on that. Tomiwa, are you the change? <laughs> Do you come with something different? I try to cover something different. I mean, our goal is um, look. Our goal is to provide perspectives on the world um, and to tell stories uh, that matter. Um, there's a, I, I think Al's position uh, about the fact that, you know, people know more about what's happening um, in New York or in the American elections than they do about what's happening in Kenya or Ghana um, is really important. And our perspective is that 
we want to tell these stories vividly. We want to tell the stories of our continent vividly. We want to tell our own stories vividly. We want to tell them thoughtfully um, and to allow Africans to see the world through African eyes um, rather than through European eyes uh, coming in or Western eyes, whatever it is coming to tell our stories. Um, and we think that matters. And that's not something that happens organically. You know, That's not something that is gonna happen on social media. Um, uh, content matters, high quality content matters, thoughtful, well-produced content matters, and it changes the way we see we see ourselves. I mean, last year we had a team of um, five people go across West Africa. They went to 14 countries over 80 days, and they filmed content around what it is like to be young uh, in West Africa today, around food, around culture, around music. Um, and they, I mean, we wrote journals for 80 days. We did uh, almost 40 videos um, about what it's like to live in contemporary West Africa. That project was called Jollof Road, um, and you can still check it out. The archive is all live at jollofroad.com. For us, that stuff matters because if you want to know what West Africa is like, your most likely place, and you've never been or you haven't, is going to be like a Discovery Channel documentary done by three guys who flew in from South Africa, uh, San Francisco and shot for a few days. How many sort of West Africans are actually documenting the reality of the subcontinent themselves and sort of like telling those stories robustly? And so uh, that's the way we think about it is that we are the ones who will tell those stories and we will tell those stories that matter. Um, and it's the same thing with Tech Cabal, which covers technology across the continent is why can't we create the narratives uh, for the continent uh, and for the globe, you know, why can't we be the ones that are responsible for shaping the way we see ourselves and the world sees us? Why do we always have to wait for other people to come and shape that narrative? It's absolutely critical. And that, that's the way we think about our work. That's where we are to change. Fantastic. Uh, I want a thumbs up from Al and Mimi if they're happy with Jamiwa's answer. Um, yeah, I think I, I would I would probably also just add to what Tamiwa said because um, you know some of the work that we've been doing a lot of uh, as Africa Communications Group is really to um, start to link the issue of narrative image building specifically at, at nation level um, with things like GDP, FDI, tourism, etc. And I, I don't think that we're, we're yet at that point where we can make the link between ownership of our own media, um, shaping of our own narratives, and how much that actually advances us in terms of economic growth. We're still at the point where we see media and narratives and image building, et cetera, at kind of a fluffy, very theoretical level. And we haven't been able to bring it down to the reality of how lives could potentially be changed just by an ownership of our own narrative um, from an economic growth and a, and a development perspective. So I think that, um, you know, um, Tomio was, was right on point in, in, in pointing that out. Uh, but yet, I do think that there still needs to be a link that's made. As long as the media uh, continues to be kind of classified, uh, especially now with social media, etc., as kind of in a bucket of its own in the creative industries bucket and is not kind of brought at the strategic table where decisions are made about economy and economic growth, et cetera, at a country level, then I think that we are, we're, we're fighting a losing battle essentially. Mm. Got that. All right, so we've spoken quite extensively about you know, technological advancements on the continent. We've spoken about some of the political issues as well that we've experienced on the continent. One thing we haven't really spoken about is this global pandemic called COVID-19 that came with a lot of fake news across the continent. And seeing that the three of you are in media, I'll, I'll start with you with this question. What, what did you have to do to prevent you know, the spread of fake news that came with COVID-19? <laughs> wow. Um, so when we when we uh, we went into lockdown very quickly after um, COVID nineteen sort of became a reality in Kenya, and one of the things that we did as an organization is that we got cracking, got cracking, and asked government. So what can we do to support um, the efforts that you're having? Um, and what happened was that we um, then um, uh, found that we needed to get stories from 
um, the citizens themselves to try and figure to get them to figure out what it is that is um, affecting them. So we were hearing stories about things like um, water was not available, sanitizer was overpriced, soap was overpriced, those sort of things. Um, and government needed to find that information so that they can crack down on it. Um, so we built something called Nuru, and I'm going to put um, a link to Nuru um, on this. It's nuru.live. Um, and essentially what that was, was that it was a citizen-facing um, um, tool that allowed um, every citizen to so talk about what is happening within their communities. It made them all reporters, so to speak. And they could take a picture, they could take a voice note, they could take a video and post it and simply say that in my community, there's a shopkeeper who is selling sanitizer at triple the cost. Um, and then um, based on that, um, government and civil society organizations would figure out what they needed to do um, to sort of support um, that community. Many communities uh, posted and said, we don't have water. Other communities said people are fighting for water. Um, you know, people are hoarding, um, going into the supermarket and cleaning everything out um, despite government directives. So um, they used Noru in that way and it became a very popular tool. Um, and then we started seeing it being used in a couple of other countries like Malawi who would pick it up and, and sort of, um, you know, in certain communities. But again, one, one of the things that we noticed is that it's very community focused um, and that sort of enforced the fact that um, communities drive um, what is important to them in their own spaces. Um, and so um, now Nuru is being picked up by um, a couple of media houses and it's been, uh, you know, alternative media houses and by civil society organizations who are saying that they want to use it to track um, citizen voices um, in, on different issues, especially on human rights and that sort of thing. Um, and because of the fact that it's free, um, we are providing them with a, with a, with a tool um, and um, providing them with the necessary support so that they can continue using it in whichever form they would like. Thank you for that, Al. Uh, Mimi, your take on COVID-19 and the spread of fake news across the continent? Yeah, I saw a very interesting comment in the um, in the chat there about the responsibility and the role of the audience uh, when it comes to fake news. And I think that's a very interesting take because as much as, you know, we tend to think that fake news and news in general is kind of imposed on us, you know, here it is, consume it or else. That's not the case. Um, and I think that there is the responsibility of the audience that we need to consider, um, you know, the application of some sort of some level of critical thinking in the in the in the content that we do consume um, and also the ability to be able to um, go away and do a little bit of research before we start spreading the the fake news it was very exciting to see even during our lockdown here in South Africa the stance that the government took towards fake news um, and in some cases in some countries uh, specifically in North Africa it became a criminal offense to, uh, to spread uh, fake news. Um, so I think there is the responsibility on all sides, regulators, audiences, uh, you know, media um, and social media users. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex issue, but I think everybody needs to come to the table. Thanks, Mimi. Um, and Tomiwa, you'll be the last one to speak. We have to wrap it up. I can't believe how quickly time has flown. So your take on, on COVID-19 and, and fake news? I think COVID's been an interesting challenge from a fake news perspective. Definitely a lot of pretty big narratives early on. I do think um, the global crackdown on that was, it's interesting and scary at the same time. So it's fantastic because you want to be able to shut down sort of like false narratives. On the other hand, um, I had a really weird thing happen. And apologies, people, because um, we're in the middle of an emergency situation. so. One's head is very, very much in our current situation in Nigeria. But yesterday there was a picture of the Nigerian flag bloodied from this uh, horrible event that happened on Tuesday. And every time you posted that image on social media or uh, Instagram or Facebook yesterday, it got a fake news tag uh, from fact checkers. It was a picture of a flag, nothing else, just the bloodied flag. And when you clicked into it, it was and you said, why was this tagged as fake news? There was a tag that had an article about COVID. And so it was like inadvertently, somehow or the other, Facebook's 
fact checking algorithm, I decided that this flag, I associated this flag with a COVID article. Um, so that's super scary because you're trying to kill um, sort of fake news. You're trying to stop people from, you know, spreading information that could be harmful for people. But you bring up sort of the fears of censorship um, and the thought police and Facebook being the one to decide what information is fake news or what information is true. And if you um, let me uh, be guilty of what Alice accused us of all of being, you know, if you've been following the American elections, you'll see that, you know, the liberals really want Facebook to be more proactive about sort of shutting down fake news because they have a president who lies like we all breathe air. Um, so they want him to be much more aggressive. On the other hand, if you care about liberalism and people's freedom and their rights, you are concerned about the possibility that, fake, that Facebook or Twitter or any of these organizations will have the power to censor what it is that we can say or what it is that, you know, we can put out there safely. So it's a complex situation. I don't think there are easy answers. Um, in terms of how we dealt with it in Africa, I think, you know, Africa dealt better with uh, COVID overall than sort of the world expected. I think some of that was actually also uh, came from our success at sort of uh, putting out the right information and sort of like enforcing some of the right behaviors um, across the continent. And so I think there's, there are ways in which we were quite successful, um, but there are a lot of sort of scary, scary side effects to that effort and the global efforts. And the next few years, I don't think this confusion is going to be easily sorted out. It's going to continue to play out in all kinds of interesting and scary and unexpected ways. I mean, nobody saw that flag thing happening yesterday. So um, yeah, we're in, a, we're in a crazy new world with all kinds of side effects that we did not expect. Um, yeah. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, a very optimistic note to end on, I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We have some music, so we're fine. Don't worry about it. Ask us something <laughs> <laughs> this was a fantastic session. A big shout out to our presenters um, joining on our panel today. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I really think that Africa is in fantastic hands with the three of you. It's quite engaging. And thank you so much for keeping it short so that we can actually, you know, discuss some of the questions that we have. If you do have any questions uh, for our speakers, I'm sure they can leave some of their, their handles or their emails on our chat box over there. There's a lot happening in that chat box. So please make sure you go through it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, while Chef and the Kitchen are getting ready for their performance to lift our spirits, I just want to remind you of our session called the Reimagining of Policy and Governance that's going to be taking place next week, Thursday, as well as a Smart Cities Policy and Action that will be taking place on Tuesday. And then lastly, the Masterclass on Using Public uh, data that will be happening on Wednesday. So please make sure you head on over to the relevant social media platforms. Make sure you register because I mean, after today's session, surely you have to come back next week. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Chef at the Kitchen, take it away. Hi, Chef in the Kitchen again here with Beg. Um, thank you very much for having us. Uh, Eben Festival 2020. Uh, thank you very much. We are Chef in the Kitchen Music Live. Uh, we are going to give you nice funk music. Our first song is Jabula. Uh, it's a traditional song, very nice song about being at home and Jabula or Sekaya. Hope you can enjoy. Hey, Jabula Ekaya, Jabula Mouthy Ekaya, Jabula Mouthy Ekaya, Jabula Mouthy Ekaya, Jabula. Chabula Nabasali Ekaya Candifica Pusa 
Hallelujah. Na femeli bandi nigu tando bandi nigu dilla bandi nigu tando bandi nigu dilla bandi nigu tando bandi nigu dilla ekaya chabu kusekaya chabu Ah, ah. 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 Chapu la gusekaya Ese ikayalagit 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 Chabu kusekaya we Chabu kusekaya we Chabu la ekaya Yeah that is Chabula We're going to do our last song the name of the song is called Africa um we pray for Nigeria during this difficult time also we pray for South Africa uh we pray for the entire Africa for God to bless us and be with us during this difficult time thank you the name of the song is called Africa hope you're going to enjoy ba! i hope you clapping where you standing yeah and go Woo! i said hey hey hey, hey. i say hey hey hey, hey. Say hey, 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 hey. What's up? My brothers and sisters, let's love one another. Masiye gukulwa, sibula la neso, ngobi Africa, ikaya let songe. Africa, 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 uh, let's come together. My Africa, 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 let's come together. My Africa, 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 uh, 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 let's come together. And I say, Masitha lengo tula Sipata nengo tolo Masiye gugulwa Sibula la neso Mobi Africa Ikaya letu songe Africa, 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 Africa Let's come together I say Africa, 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 and let's come together. My Africa, 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 and let's come together. We say Nigeria, how na de lisu tu dumela. Zimbabwe, Livuga Njani, Nigeria, Haunare, Aseikana, Togo, Libya, Tanzania, my South Africa. Africa, 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 who say hey, hey, hey. I say hey hey 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 hey. Africa, Africa, Africa. 
Africa, Africa, let's come together. Africa, 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 let's come together. Thank you very much for having us. We are Chef and the Kitchen Music. Thank you so much to Eden Festival 2020. Thank you very much to Jam Cafes. Thank you so much. We are Chef and the Kitchen Music. We love you. Yeah. Hey.